Yorana, kia ora, good morning. I'm very happy to be back in Aotearoa. I come here often, and I'm always happy to see my Maori cousins. So, as uh, David presented, I am from Tahiti, formerly in government, uh, but before government, I was in the private sector my entire life. In 2007 is where my journey with Floating City starts. Um, I was invited to participate in a government, a pro-independence government, and a shout out to them. They just won elections again last Friday, so they're back in. And my portfolio was tourism, so I was tourism minister, and one of the first things I had to look at was exposure to sea level rise. We have 48 airports, all at sea level, all our hotels are at sea level, our power substations, our sewage treatment plants, basically all of the necessary infrastructure for tourism is at sea level. 2007 was interesting for us. It was the first time we read, as, as Tahitians, we read articles talking about sea level rise making a lot of our islands. So we have about 118 islands throughout our country. 68 of them are right at sea level, so low-line atolls. And the New York Times ran an article that summer of 2007 saying, by 2050, you're going to have to either displace your people on all these islands in the Pacific, think about Tuvalu, Kiribati, Vanuatu, some islands obviously in the Cook Islands, and Marshall Islands, and all over the world you have low-lying atolls. And as a politician, I had to think further than just our political terms, so I presented to our government different options. And one of them was managed retreat, I'm sure you have discussions about this here, but it's not an easy topic for any politician to tackle. How do you tell people to move from their islands? So that's where I started, 2007, and I'll walk you through a short presentation of where the state of the art is today, and as real estate professionals, I think you'll appreciate how much has changed in the last, I'd say, decade because of sea level rise, because of ESG and everything we heard previously, um, but also because of huge pressures. So my job over the next 40 minutes is to convince you that Mark Twain was actually wrong. Uh, we will be making more land, and you're actually here in Auckland. This is reclaimed land, and I'll show you a slide of how much of the Auckland waterfront is actually reclaimed land. So we have been, for at least 400 years, creating new land onto the ocean. And I'll explain why floating is by far the best uh, solution. So one question I often get, um, to David's sci-fi um, uh, comment, we actually had the author of the terrible movie, you mentioned Waterworld, at the UN Roundtable in 2019 to ask him, what were you thinking? Um, it was the realm, floating cities have been the realm of, of science fiction since the 1890s. Uh, Jules Verne famously wrote three different books on floating cities. One of them was called uh, Milliard, Billion Island. It left San Francisco. It floated through the Pacific, it came to Tahiti, and then it, um, uh, it moored in, in Fiji. So it was an interesting tale of the excesses of capitalism in, uh, in the 19th century. So what brings floating cities out of science fiction and into hardcore engineering, uh, real cities looking at, at this, are the two, the dual challenges that are faced by coastal cities. So, the first one, and, and you heard this previously, is that 90% of megacities, and most people aren't aware of this, 90% of megacities, that cities of more than 10 million, that's obviously not Auckland, are coastal. And there's a whole historical reason why they are coastal. And those cities are under incredible pressure to keep growing. We're talking about 3 million people a week are moving into cities, a lot of them are coastal. You have cities like Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, you got Lagos in Nigeria, that are projected to have 80 million people. By 2060, 2070, we're not sure. So think about a city of 80 million people. So huge pressure from developers, of course, to the cities and the mayors to say, look, we need to expand. We need more land, we need a stadium, we need more schools. And a lot of that expansion has been done historically by reclaiming shallow estuaries and coastlines. So this is the response. This is an interesting slide. I think this is in the Middle East. But this has been going on for 400 years. And I'd like to convince you that this is the past. 
and that the future will be floating and that we will no longer be reclaiming as we did in the past. Obviously, anytime you dump dirt or sand or rocks into the ocean, you decimate. There is no marine ecosystem. Obviously, you just destroy it. And you'll see there are many other issues with it. This is the one that particularly hits home for me and for a lot of us Pacific Islanders is displacement. There, you have entire countries like Kiribati uh, that will lose nationhood if all of their people need to move to New Zealand. So you're one of the first, you are the first country in the world to pass legislation allowing climate migration. I don't know the politics of it, I don't know where it's at, but I know it, it happened a few years ago. Uh, this is a reality for a lot of the prime ministers in the region. What do we do when all of our people leave? Well, the UN says if your people leave, you lose your sovereignty. If you lose your sovereignty, you lose your language, you lose your culture, no more passports, and guess who takes all of your exclusive economic zone? Guess who comes and fishes your waters and takes your resources? It's no longer your country. So this is not an issue uh, simply of development. It's one of survival for a lot of us in the Pacific. So in 2019, uh, actually 2017, I decided to move from Tahiti to New York. I figured if I wanted to work with Bjark Ingalls, he's in New York, the UN is in New York, MIT is right up the road in Boston. I had to move, so ended up moving to New York City. And this is uh, Oceanic City, so this is our first version of a floating city that we proposed. It's a sustainable floating city that we proposed at the UN. So this, this is an interesting chapter in, in floating cities. Um, we had the Deputy Secretary General at our round table, and she um, was very candid. Uh, she said we would never have considered uh, supporting or even discussing an issue like this even five years ago. So in, in, a, in a sense, it, it, it's a failure of diplomacy and of all these talks to come up with solutions so the UN opened up to engineers. So now it's more about what are the engineering solutions to all of these issues we're facing. Obviously, the political solutions aren't working. So this is what a floating city looks like underneath. Think about a very large concrete, for those of you in the construction industry, you know that there have been concrete caissons since the 19, early 1900s. It's a very well-known uh, technology. They're just basically cellular concrete platforms. Um, let me just go back to one slide. Um, I, I failed to mention the, the architect on this, our partner and, and, and shareholder in Oceanics is Bjarke Ingels. So we went to Bjarke because he was already working on some floating student housing in, in the Netherlands, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, I think in Denmark. And we thought he was the right visionary to help us uh, convey to, to the world what we're trying to do. Uh, Arup were, were the engineers on this. I noticed you, you mentioned them. They've got a huge experience in, in the maritime sector, and including oil rigs. So just one second. So floating cities are obviously anchored to the seabed. They're not floating off, and they're close to shore. So we're convinced this is an interesting uh, map. It's called the Spillhouse Projection. It shows the world as just one big ocean and coastline around it. But it is one big ocean. And as most of us remember uh, from high school, it's 70%, over 2 thirds of the surface of the planet. So what we're trying to do with our teens is not only meet shelter, but also energy. So there are a lot of energy sources in the ocean that uh, we're tapping into. Obviously, you're sitting on water, so there's a way of uh, desalinating. And also food. Food is actually the toughest. So one of the key features, and I think this will be interesting for the real estate developers, is the fact that floating cities are adaptable. And by adaptable, we mean that they rise with rising seas. You don't have to worry about how high the seawall in front of your stadium or your nuclear power plant or your airport is. It doesn't matter if the IPCC projections are right or wrong, they float. So ad adaptability is, is a key feature. A reconfigurable, you can change it and move it around. Sustainable is at the core of what we're, what we're building. And scalable is important if we want to meet uh, the challenge. Um, when I mentioned the three million people moving into cities uh, every week, what I didn't mention are the projections that the UN, the OECD, and a number of organizations have come up with. And it's staggering. In order to meet the demands of people moving into cities, we need to double, double the built environment by 2060. So this was a statistic from 2020. So 40 years, double the entire built environment. 
That's roads, energy, water, sewage, transport, everything. So then you bring it back and you go, okay, what does that mean in square feet and square meters? Um, well, it means New York City every single month for 40 years. It means Paris every seven days for 40 years. So you don't see it here. I don't see it in Tahiti. But if you're the mayor of Lagos, Nigeria, you do see it. There's a huge growth, and we don't know where the energy is going to come, the sand, the concrete, the labor. So that's one of the key drivers is where are we building? So this is a cross section of what a floating platform looks like. So again, this was uh, designed by Arup, and the big question was how much draft? You know, how deep do these need to be? How wide? And for the engineers in the room, obviously, we want to be very wide and not have very much wind exposure. So you'll see floating cities will have low buildings. You're not going to see skyscrapers. Um, you can have up to four stories, and they're going to be in very shallow and protected areas, like your beautiful harbor here. And then they will be tethered to the seabed. Uh, underneath them, uh, under the floating part, is where you'll have all your technical systems, uh, sewage treatment, uh, batteries, uh, storage, uh, refuge, and of course, tethered. So um, in terms of reconfiguration, and this is interesting for urban planners, so we had the privilege of working with some of the top urban planners in New York, and one of the things that got them really excited was what happens when a city wants to change something. Uh, try doing it you know, with existing uh, land. You just can't take a building and, and move it, I and mean, you can if it's a smaller one. But at this scale, each one of these platforms is two hectares, so five acres, 20,000 square meters, and they can be towed and moved. So as the city grows, this example I'm showing you here is 10,000 people, about the same urban density as, as Brooklyn and New York. So this is a sustainability piece. Uh, we had the privilege of working with top sustainability experts in all of the verticals. And the task was, OK, if you put people in the middle, <laughs> What is it that we need? Uh, so you need power, food. You need to obviously figure out what you do with your wastewater. And you don't want to have any outputs, uh, and in particular trash and sewage, into the harbor where you're living. So it was very important that each one of these systems feeds into the other. So we're working with Wurtzilla out of Finland to figure out, OK, so all of our sewage water goes into these systems, then what do you do? And nobody on the team wanted to drink. Uh, the retreated sewage water like they do on the space station. So we've got two different circuits. You've got potable uh, water on one end and you have technical water on the other. So this is the basic, uh, uh, the basic platform and what was critical in our design um, with not only Arab but also the construction company. So we're working with Buig, uh, Buig Construction. I'm not sure they have a footprint in in New Zealand, but they're doing a lot of work um, in, in Australia and in Korea. Uh, I think fifth or sixth largest construction company in the world. What we were interested in was, can this scale? Can you build me one unit, and then if it works, build me another, and obviously keep lowering the cost, but make this something that we can replicate? Otherwise, if it's a one-off, we weren't interested. There are a number of companies building floating infrastructure, but it's usually one-offs. What we're interested in is actually getting platforms that we could build at scale, which I'll explain why South Korea was interesting. So this is around 300 people on one platform. And then you can assemble these platforms into a village, and it can grow and just keep growing. There is no limit, obviously, to the number of these that can be interconnected. I'll quickly go through yeah, uh, the main systems. So uh, food is complicated on floating platforms. The Dutch have tried putting cows on a floating barge in Rotterdam, and uh, the cows aren't happy. And the mayor is not happy because the cows jump into the water, and then it costs a fortune to get the cows out. So we're not having uh, any cattle. So cattle farming will leave to you on land. Uh, but plant-based food is very interesting, uh, and not just. And, and you have fish. So pes think about a pescatarian diet. Now, we're thinking of floating cities very close to existing cities. This is not out in the middle of nowhere. This is really an extension of your city. Uh, so anybody who wants meat can just either walk across the bridge or bring his own meat. But we're not going to be growing the meat. Zero waste is critical. Uh, every city is looking at you know how are they going to treat that. You can't just offshore it to another country. Uh, New York City doesn't treat its waste. It goes to four different states. 
So every day, you know, thousands of tons leave the state. Uh, so zero waste is important. At zero, of course, you all know why that's needed. Fresh water is, is critical that we have autonomy. We are not um, considering tethering ourselves and becoming a parasite to the city. You already have enough issues. You, you have your own, we need to be able to supply our own water and energy. Uh, mobility, obviously, is important. And uh, critical is habitat regeneration. We're making a big bet that floating infrastructure will actually rehabilitate your harbor as opposed to be uh, to be in an environmental uh, mess. Um, this is similar to that previous uh, chart. It shows how all of the systems feed into each other and uh, the fact that there is no effluent. There's not one drop of treated uh, or untreated sewage that ends up in, in the harbor. We looked at all sorts of um, solutions for vertical farming, uh, very power intensive, so there's always debates between the, the energy guys and the food guys. Uh, if you want food, you need energy, and the energy says, well, we need more solar panels. So uh, there'll be a lot of uh, work to be done in the next few decades to figure out what exactly you can do with, with the energy. But um, uh, 3D ocean farming is very interesting, is where you grow all sorts of, um, of different foods at different trophic levels. So what you feed at the top, uh, their excrement goes to the second level, and then the third, and, and finally at the bottom we have sea cucumbers which uh, my Chinese cousins uh, love. Um, so waste, I spoke about. There are a number of systems that allow uh, recycling, but a lot of it is a change in the way people uh, approach this. There are cities in, um, in Japan that are entire zero waste. You've got a lot of the Nordic countries that have really advanced on this. And I'm happy, uh, that's why we partnered, one of the reasons we partnered with South Korea, they're incredibly, there's not any organic waste in South Korea, at least in Seoul, that goes into landfill. Not one, everything gets, uh, they, they have a, very, a separate bin just for organics. Not the case in New York City. Uh, energy, um, we're quite excited about ocean thermal energy conversion. It's an old technology, but uh, we feel that in certain islands, uh, not necessarily here and on, but there are certain islands we're looking at where you have a temperature differential between the surface water, which happens to be getting hotter as well, and deep ocean water around 900 to 1,000 meters deep. And that temperature differential is enough to run a cycle that allows for perpetual uh, energy. Think about the ocean as just one huge uh, battery. Of course, you have wave energy, wind turbines, everything else is pretty well understood and known. Um, water is critical. Uh, we're not wasting a drop of rainwater. So any rain on our platforms goes through pavers and gets captured. Um, our platforms are flood proof, so obviously it doesn't matter how much it rains, the water will, if, that we're not catching, will roll off and go into the ocean. So fast forward from 2019 when we presented this to the UN, um, it was a full day event. Uh, James Cameron, uh, his, his wife uh, represented him. He was there to talk about food. His wife was there to talk about food. We had a Nobel Prize. Um, economics uh, laureate um, Joseph Stiglitz, who has talked a lot about the importance of inclusivity in cities. You can't just build a city for a bunch of wealthy people and think it's going to work. Um, and at the end of, uh, of a full day of, of this roundtable, everybody agreed that what we needed was an actual prototype. You need that first platform. You need to build one. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, people need to see it, investors, insurance companies, everybody just needs to see that first platform. But it's a heavy lift. 20,000 uh, square meters of floating concrete and displaces 82,000 tons. It's the size of a, it displaces as much as a Nimitz class uh, aircraft carrier. It's a big piece of kit and someone has to pay for it. So fast forward, I'll spare you COVID, uh, that was a mess. Um, Busan, so through our networks um, and through the UN, uh, we were able to talk, to talk to the mayor of Busan. Now, he has a big ambition for his city. It's a city twice the size of Auckland, so around 3.4 million people. And he wants uh, Busan to be the site for Expo 2030. So when we went to him and said, hey, you've got this amazing harbor. Could we build our prototype with you and with the support, obviously, of Korean companies? 
I need not have mentioned this in the beginning, but Oceanics is a for-profit company. <laughs> Even though we work with the UN, a lot of people confuse the mission with, okay, this is uh, a non-profit. We're not. We're a for-profit company. We're backed by venture capital. And uh, venture capital likes to um, understand uh, who's going to build this and how is it going to be done. So the main objective of our investors was find a city uh, who's willing to put their name, reputation, capital behind something like this. And again, the mayor of Busan was open for a number of reasons. So our team went there, studied uh, the marine ecosystem, saw how deep the harbor was, what were the needs of the city, um, and again, this Expo 2030. So those three first platforms are the pro prototype. So we work with Deloitte in Korea, and Deloitte said, if you build one, not sure we can get the big uh, companies involved. It's a bit small. Uh, why don't you build three platforms? So this was the result of that work. Uh, it had to make sense also economically. So three platforms is phase one. Um, then a future expansion. Um, hopefully, uh, if Busan wins Expo 2030, this is part of the Expo 2030 experience. And uh, third phase is an expansion then on a uh, waterfront that is low value, some of the warehouses and uh, shipping docks uh, that, that Busan historically has. So you'll notice something interesting. Um, these are shallow waters and very protected by the natural uh, geography of, of Busan. And you have something very similar um, throughout New Zealand and in particular here in, in Auckland. So these are the perfect types of, uh, of environments for floating cities. Just more renderings. These are the first three platforms. They're interconnected. Uh, one of them is where people will live. The other one will work. And the other one is maybe for conferences, different use cases. Again, very happy to be working with the team at uh, Big and, and Bjarke in particular. You'll notice the low buildings. That's uh, critical. And our engineers, um, we're also working with the MIT Center for Ocean Engineering, the world's oldest uh, marine architecture, marine engineering school. And um, they gave us our first constraints. It was the hardest presentation I ever did uh, to a room full of uh, uh, professors from MIT trying to explain the vision. And they went, well, yeah, you can do it, but under certain conditions. And the conditions are you don't go to the 40-second, you know, don't try to be an oil rig, you know, with 30-meter waves. Do this in shallow protected waters. And be wide, and you don't want to go too high, and you don't want to have too much of a draft either. So this is the result of all of that work with Arup and MIT. So I'm going to also talk about other floating projects out there. I didn't want to leave you with the impression that this is just um, some Tahitian who came up with an idea and you know got the UN involved and suddenly this happened. No, this has been going on for decades. Now maybe the timing wasn't right because city planners weren't worried about sea level rise. They are today. There maybe weren't those pressures to keep developing the waterfront. They're there now. Um, but we stand on the shoulders of giants. We had people like Buckminster Fuller, uh, who was an amazing thinker, architect, inventor. He designed a full floating city uh, for Tokyo Bay in the 1960s. And then he designed, designed one for Chesapeake Bay in the United States. Then he designed one for Toronto. We have Sir Ovi, I don't know if that's Ovi Arup, who was involved in 1972 uh, on a um, he was on the board of, a, of an organization that wanted to build a floating city off the UK. So this goes back decades and decades, but it's usually driven by, um, I'd say, engineers and architects who go, well, why don't we just do this? Uh, but there wasn't really the push from cities. And now, now it's a pull. Now we feel cities are. So I'll talk about a few other floating projects out there in the world. So these are historical. These, these are out there. Some of these have been out there for millennia. Uh, some of the fishing villages um, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, in China. Um, you have generations of people who are born and who die on these floating settlements. And some of them have thousands of people. You can go to Iraq uh, before Saddam Hussein uh, cut off the water to, uh, to their estuaries there. You had a tribe of people who had been there for a 1,000 years on floating infrastructure, floating homes. Um, I had mentioned Bjarke Engel's work with floating, um, the one in the middle, student housing. It was in Denmark. Um, I like the one in the middle. That one's interesting. Um, it was built after a big fire in New York City. The poles of all of the piers in New York were all these wooden poles with creosote, and one of them burned, and the entire pier burned down. 
and it was post-war, and the engineer who worked on the caissons that helped the Americans land at Normandy, I don't know if you've seen these breakwaters, they're still there. You can go to Normandy and you'll still see them. They were built in secret um, in the UK and towed overnight across the English Channel and they were sunk. So it's just big concrete boxes. That same engineer comes back to the US after the war and says, why don't we rebuild uh, Pier 57 with floating caissons? So they built them upriver up the Hudson and there's a New York Times front page picture of concrete boxes floating down the Hudson and people standing there going, how does concrete float? <laughs> so I talked to the developer who bought this and, and then leased it to Google. I said, look, you, you own this now, it's 65 years old. What shape is it in? And he said, look, they hadn't done any sort of repairs for it when they, and they bought it, they did a full inspection. They said, yeah, it's a few minor, no leaks or anything like that. I said, well, how long will it last, do you think? He says, well, indefinitely. This isn't gonna move, it's, it's there, it's floating. So if you visit New York, you know that Pier 57 has been floating there for over 60 years. Now on to bigger uh, projects similar to, to what Oceanics is trying to do. This is in the Maldives. It's called the Maldives Floating City. It's a Dutch outfit um, that has worked with the government there. These are 5,000 homes. So this is different than Oceanics because it's site specific and it's for a need of that government, that city, that island. Um, it's not necessarily scalable, so we have a different approach uh, on this, but it is interesting. Um, this proposal uh, is called Green Float, 50,000 residents on this, $40 billion price tag. This was proposed to us in the Pacific, uh, to the government of Kiribati. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Anote Tong had this huge engineering company, Shimizu, from Japan come and say, hey, you guys are sinking, let's build you this floating city. And said, okay, how much? $40 billion. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried raising $40 billion. Uh, when you're a poor country in the Pacific, it's hard. So obviously that project didn't go anywhere until uh, I think end of 2022, the Singapore government, which has more money, is looking at this very seriously. So you may see something like this in, in Singapore. So different types of models. Uh, now this one definitely has the capital uh, behind it. So this is Saudi, Saudi Arabia. I'm sure you've all seen the line and Neom. This is an extension of the line onto the ocean. Now, seven kilometer wide floating city is not a small uh, task. Um, again, site specific for their needs. They need a logistics port, they want it floating, um, but it's not an exportable product. What we're looking for is something that we can build for the world, not uh, just for this one. But I don't think anybody will doubt the financial capacity of, of uh, the fund in, in Saudi Arabia to fund this. So um, I'm coming towards the end uh, of my presentation and I wanted to speak to you as, as, as real estate um, professionals and, and developers and I hope there are some urbanists in here and some people who can um, understand not just the local implications but, but global of floating versus land reclamation. That's our, our real, uh, what our investors uh, talk about is the total addressable market. You know, so what is the market? Um, it's pretty impressive. It's a huge amount. Uh, most people aren't aware that over the last 30 years, a thousand square kilometers around the world have been reclaimed. Now, a thousand square kilometers is one and a half times Singapore. So 24% of Singapore is actually reclaimed. China banned land reclamation in 2018, but prior to that, I think 700 square kilometers were, per year were them. So this is just, it's continuing to happen. Cities are still growing. A thousand square kilometers is also almost exactly the size of, of Auckland. So imagine somewhere around the world that surface. So that's a lot of real estate in different places. Um, I'll talk about one of the most impressive ones is Monaco. Our partner, Bui Construction, is doing the land reclamation work in Monaco. It's six hectares, so whatever that is in acres, 15 acres or so. Uh, the cost per square meter is, is staggering. Uh, basically, land reclamation is easy if you've got a foot to reclaim. Very hard when you have 23 meters, you know, when your shore is very, uh, very steep. So this brings me to where we are standing today. So I'm sure a lot of you from, uh, from New Zealand, from Auckland, have seen this map. I didn't know that Fort Street used to be called Four, F-O-R-E, Street. And it used to be the forefront. That's, that's where the water's edge was. And everything you see north of that on this has been reclaimed. 
So it started, I believe, in the 1830s, different campaigns. It was obviously a lot easier to do in the 1850s, 1870s than it is today. I, I read an article last year where the chair of uh, Ports of Auckland said it is no longer sustainable for us to continue reclaiming in the harbor. So I, I don't think you're going to see more land reclamation, but again, I, I leave that to the local um, politicians. Um, the next slide is very interesting. Try to keep this one in mind when you see the next one. So these are the projections, and these are very modest projections. These are not the worst of the worst, uh, but these are sea level rise uh, projections. So what happens, it very coincidentally, happens to be the same land that was reclaimed because in the 1830s, they figured, well, look, it's higher than the average wave, but they weren't planning for 2030, 2050. So this is gonna be a huge issue for any of you who hold assets. Uh, as George mentioned, stranded assets, I don't know what happens to all of this. Um, I'll strongly discourage uh, building walls. If you think building a wall around infrastructure, a number of people, if you have a nuclear power plant, yes, build a wall. But if you have any sort of other uh, coastal waterfront, what happens with a wall it keeps the seawater out, but guess what it keeps in? The rainwater. So unless you have very, very strong pumps to pump the fresh water from the rain out into the ocean, it's a losing game. And um, in the Pacific, we tend to say, you know, we have seawalls all over Tahiti. I think 80% of our shoreline has seawalls. Uh, we say there are two types of seawalls, uh, the ones that have fallen into the ocean and the ones that are in the process of falling into the ocean. So seawalls are, are not a solution. So um, this is where the state of the art is today. Um, cost is going to be the main driver for cities to adopt floating infrastructure. Um, these figures, these are not easy to find. Dredging companies, there's a handful of companies around the world that are doing this work. Uh, they mostly come from one particular country in Northern, Northern, Northern Europe, um, and obviously they're not completely public about what these things cost, but what all the research we've been able to do with the UN is that we're looking around 2,000 to 16,000. Now, $16,000 a square meter is an outlier. I mentioned a smaller country earlier that that's closer to what that costs. And we are looking at least in South Korea with labor there, with the cost of steel and concrete, we are looking between 1,000, and some people are more ambitious, they think we'll hit $800 per square meter. And that is very interesting because if you're a city planner and you have to wonder, okay, at cost parity, one of them is gonna take me five to 10 years. Now land reclamation is a tricky business. You don't just reclaim and build. Uh, ask uh, the engineers at Kansai, that built the Kansai airport. They had a choice. Uh, the government tested a floating airport in, in Tokyo Bay, it worked. It was a kilometer long, Airports land, I mean, airplanes landed, it worked. I guess the dredging lobby ended up winning and they reclaimed a vast surface for the airport. Within months of it being built, it started sinking. And it's sinking so fast that all the infrastructure, not the runways, but the buildings, think about an air, airport building, it's all on jacks. The entire building is on hydraulic jacks. And they go around, they check, they up it a millimeter here, a millimeter there. So um, land reclamation takes a long time. I think Singapore waits 10 to 15 years for it to settle. Um, obviously, there's no comparison uh, when it comes to sea level rise. Uh, if you float, it doesn't matter. I, I, I don't care which researchers write. If the, in, the Twaits, uh, Twaits you know, uh, melt in Antarctica, is it six feet, is it six meters, is it 60 meters? We don't know, but floating will be uh, impervious to that. Uh, environmental is very, very critical. We run into this issue in, in a lot of the cities I speak to is the mayors and the developers have a need, but you also have, um, oh, right on time. You have the environmental lobbies, and very legitimately, I, I would put myself more on the environmental side of this, they're not happy with all the destruction that goes on. Most land reclamation has been done in mangroves around the world, and now we're discovering, oh, well, the mangroves actually mitigated uh, against uh, climate events and, and big waves. So uh, I think you'll get a lot more uh, pushback. And, Regenerating marine ecosystems is absolutely doable. Permitting, I just mentioned, and another risk, and I mention it because I am here, 
um, but this happens in many uh, cities I talk to, is reclaimed land doesn't perform the same way when there's an earthquake. It actually can liquefy, changes its geotechnical qualities. A floating infrastructure is base isolated. So it just, it doesn't matter what happens to the land, it's floating on the water, it's not going to shake. And that is my presentation. Thank you.